Yeah. So hi. Um, we have so far seen um, basic introduction to market research. We talked about the industry. We have talked about uh, different methods of sampling, how to determine a sample size. And then we looked at the refresher and static series in terms of mean, medium, mode, standard deviation, of course, the normal distribution, sampling distribution, and central limit theorem. Now, all this is, uh, is really the conceptual background. Uh, after this, we'll start talking about qualitative research and questionnaire design. Now, before we go to those things, we need to get familiar with certain terms which are very specific to the market research industry. Uh, more specifically, the market research industry in India, uh, because they will keep coming up in the course of when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, questionnaire design, or when we talk about what is the target group for the qualitative research, so on and so forth. So we need to get those terms uh, out of the way. We need to understand that well before we move forward. Right. So can we go on one slide? Uh, so these are the terms that we'll be talking about, about 15 terms each. None of this is very co very complicated, uh, but it's important that you understand each of this really well. So we'll talk about household, chief wage earner, housewife or householder, adult member of the family, uh, monthly household income, socioeconomic class, urban and rural areas, Metropolitan cities, mini metros, class one towns, MRSI, SOMA, target group, demographics, psychographics, etc. Okay, these are the main terms that we will learn here. But can we go forward? Okay, so what is a household? Um, a household is a collection of people uh, who lives together under one roof and who eat food prepared in the same kitchen, all right? So, uh, so it's pretty evident, right? Five, six people live together in a house, they live under one roof, they eat food prepared from the same kitchen, they're a household. But then that definition applies to a hostel as well. A hostel has 160 students who live together under one roof, they eat food prepared from the same kitchen, the hostel kitchen. Does it make them a household? No. So there are three conditions. People belong to the same family, who live together under one roof, and who eat food prepared from the same kitchen. So even within a particular building, if there are two subunits of a family and they have different kitchens, they're considered to be two different households. Now, this is very extremely important in market research because we there are times we uh, do a sample study among individuals. There are times we do a study with respect to a household as a whole. So we need to know what a household is. Okay, and one important thing that I think we should remember is that uh, very, very roughly, not accurately, but very, very roughly, every household in India has about 5 to 5.5 people. Because typically in India, three generations live together, grandparents, children, and their children types. So, uh, that the grandparents, parents, and their children types. So, average number of people in a household is 5 to 5.5. Maybe slightly more than rural areas, where people still have joint families to some extent. Maybe slightly less in urban areas. And, you know, many, many families these days are just two people families, right? Uh, husband and wife living together, uh, you know, working till they have a baby, so on and so forth. So let's go forward to the next one. The next one is chief wage earner. The chief wage earner is not the same as a person who earns the most. The chief wage earner is the person who contributes the maximum money to the running of the household. So in a family, if there is one person, if two people both earn 50,000 rupees, but one person's entire salary goes into the household expenditure, the other person saves 25,000 rupees and gives 25,000 rupees to the household. And the person who gives 50,000 rupees is the chief wage earner. The, the, the logic behind this is that the household's expenditure pattern will be based on how much money is given by the person who contributes the maximum money, which is why that person is a cheap wage earner. And you know, when we talk, when you talk about studies involving, say, purchase of an, a car or purchase of a TV, you know, generally in Indian homes, we say the decision is taken by the head of the household, which very often is also the cheap wage earner. 
right? So even in a family where, let's say, there is a gentleman about 50s and he's working in the central government and earns 50,000 rupees a month. And he's got a son who works in the IT sector and earns 1 lakh a month. But the elderly person is seen as the head of the household because, because that's where our culture is. Also, the elderly person puts his entire 50,000 to the family. And he must be telling his son, you just give 5,000, 10,000, save up for your future. But again, that's part of our family culture, right? So that's why that person is the chief wage earner as well, okay? Now, the third thing is housewife or householder. Housewife is a traditional term. It's a politically incorrect term in today's context because it is essentially sexist. It assumes that only a lady stays at home and looks after things. That's no longer the case and should not be the case as well, of course. Therefore, we have started calling it householder. So the person who takes decisions with respect to the kitchen, what kind of cooking oil should we buy, what kind of atta should we buy, what kind of detergent should we buy for the home, so on and so forth, that is the householder. So any survey which involves detergent for the home, scouring powder for the vessels, cooking oils, uh, branded atta, branded rice, milk, etc., etc., you know, in those kind of studies, the actual respondent within the household will be the householder. So the entire market research industry understands the fact that knock on the door and ask for the householder. We know what we're talking about, right? So the importance of these terms is that the entire industry understands them the same way, which is how we all communicate with each other. If I go to somebody and say chief wage earner and the person doesn't understand what I'm talking about, every time I can't be explaining. So it's important that we all understand the terms in the same fashion so that we can focus on the real topics of discussion. Can we go forward? Are these terms clear? Let's go forward. So the next set of terms, starting with adult member, in market research, okay, any adult who is 15, any person who is 15 plus years of age is considered an adult. Anybody who is less than 15 is considered a child. Now this distinction is important because there are certain ethical guidelines governing how children are meant to be interviewed. So children below 8, should not be interviewed unless the mother is also present. Children from 8 to 15 cannot be asked certain kind of questions, so on and so forth. That's a logic behind calling them children or adults as the case might be. So 15 plus is stated as an adult. Very often you will find the study being described as any adult. All of us understand that is 15 plus, right? Monthly household income. If somebody comes to your home and asks you your income, your dad or your mom won't tell them. Why? Why? Evil eye. Evil eye. Indian culture thing. Uh, I'm doing well. If I tell somebody, you know, I'll get evil eye, my luck will turn. There'll be jinx on me. There's one reason why Indians never reveal the real income. Right? Uh, also, some people are genuinely scared that income tax is sending people to ask questions. Right? So, normally people understate their income. Understate. If they earn 10,000, they'll say they're earning 5,000 in a survey. But nonetheless, we are forced to ask income sometimes. We avoid it as much as possible, but we're forced to ask. So, uh, the way we work the question is, we say, can you tell me your family's total income? Please include sources from salaries of all uh, working people. Income from rent, if you have any rent coming in. Income, agricultural income, if you have coming in, or money from shares, so on and so forth. All that becomes a combined total income. And we call it monthly household income, MHI. When you say MHI, the whole industry understand, understands it in a certain way, the same way. Uh, and we ask it in, in, in what we call, in statistical terms, it's called class intervals. We don't ask a person, what is your MHI? We ask him, would your, would your MHA be, be less than 5,000 or it will be 5 to 10,000 or will it be 10 to 20,000? We ask them in groups and these groups in statistical terms like we saw in the last session are called class intervals, okay? Okay, let's go forward. Now, since People don't give the real answer to the income. The market research industry worldwide, including in India, had to develop something called the socio-economic class. 
social economic class or classification okay now it is like a surrogate for income we cannot directly ask income we cannot directly ask the purchasing power so we, so we try to use some other variable which is closely linked to income so the variable we were using was called social economic class and uh, it is based on the chief wage earner which we've already seen it's based on that person's education and that person's occupation so as somebody who is a postgraduate uh, let's say a lawyer a postgraduate with what is called the professional qualification and i know an m tech or an mba or a lawyer or a doctor md and was employed in a senior position or as a businessman with, with the number of people working under him or her that person would be considered the highest level of social economic class what we call a1 a person is completely uh, illiterate and is working in a very low level of work like you know, a railway station uh, coolie would be the lowest level of social economic class and between this there's a full range possible right so um, I used the word illiterate. Can you tell me what it means? Excellent. So, a literate person is somebody who can sign their own name. An illiterate person cannot sign his own name. So, on that matter, I said lowest level of worker. So, I meant unskilled worker. What is an example of an unskilled worker? What is an example of a skilled worker? So, a skilled worker is somebody like a carpenter, okay, a plumber, etc. There is some skill involved. Unskilled worker is somebody who can just lift things and so on and so forth. There is no real skill involved, okay. Right. So SEC stands for socioeconomic class, and this was in use in India since about the 1990s, over 30 years now. But today there's an updated and a better system, which is called NCCS. It's basically the same as SEC, just a new name with slightly different way of measuring, and this stands for the new consumer classification system. So this is based on the education of the chief age earner, which is there earlier as well. But instead of occupation, it's number of standard durables that they own. Okay, so uh, the advantage in this system is that uh, it is dynamic. So, I mean, uh, let's look at the earlier system. If a person is a postgraduate and a businessman, and if progressively the standard of life improves, but the SEC always remains the same. Whereas here, if the person earlier had a color TV and now buys a higher level of television or buys a car, the standard of living is improving and that should be reflected in the system. So this system is better in that sense. Plus this system applies for both rural India and for urban India. We will soon see what is rural urban. Whereas this system was only for urban India. So this is the two reasons why this is a improve the system which is in use today but it's not to say the system is perfect it can always get better right clear about SEC and NCCs let's go forward so this is how the SEC grid looks right I told you right there are various levels so for example if a person is a graduate or a postgraduate general which is BSc MSc BA BCom MCom etc and if the person is a self is a is a working in a in a salesman role, right? Then this meets here. This person would be B1. Rather, this household, the entire household is classified as per the chief wage earner's uh, occupation education. Okay. So the lowest level of this illiterate and unskilled. Or school up to four years and unskilled right or skilled worker but still illiterate or even a petty trader and illiterate so this is the lowest level this is the highest level right clear quite logical right so it is not one straight line 
it is a little bit here and there. I mean, you will find an A here, for example. See, there's an A1 here. This person is not well educated, but it's a businessman with more than 10 people. So they're doing so well in the career that it compensates for the lack of education. Right? So there's still A1. So on and so forth. Okay? Let's go to the next one. This is the NCC script, the new one. So the same thing we have illustrate, right, up to graduate, postgraduate, professional. But this is the number of durables that they have. If they have only one, meaning out of TV, fridge, car, etc., they have only one of those. That's very low. But if they have all of them, TV and fridge and car and washing machine and laptop and this and that, and they are very highly educated, that household is A1. This goes to A E3. So there's A1, there's A2, there is A3, then there's B1, and there is B2. There's no C B3, right? There's C1, and there is C2, there is D1, there is D2, then there is E1, E2, and E3. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 levels. Okay, understood SEC and NCCs. We can go forward. Right. So, earlier I mentioned that SEC is only for urban India. So, what is urban? What is rural? It is not just our opinion of a city will have uh, roads, a city will have a cinema theater or a mall, and so on and so forth. No. There's a very specific tradition followed by India, not just market research. There's an Indian, this definition comes from the Indian, you know. We, in school, we study history and civics, right? Civics is about local government and all. This definition comes from that, right? Uh, three conditions have to be met for an area to be classified as urban. One, it should be governed by a municipal corporation. What's the other thing? It's a panchayat. Two, the population density should be at least 400 people per square meter, kilometer, sorry. Three, not more than 25%. So can be 10%, 11%. Should be engaged in agricultural occupations, which are like farming, livestock, poultry. What is poultry? Eat chicken and eggs and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. So um so when all the three conditions are met, that's urban. Anything else is a rural. It's not any one of the three conditions. All the three have to be met. Right? For your information, nearly 75% of India's population actually lives in rural areas. Even today, when most of us live in cities and we think cities are so big and they are big, but still 70% lives in rural areas. Okay? Now, within urban area, we all talk about metros. Oh, Chennai is a metro. Oh, Bombay is a metro. Right? A metro is a town with a population of more than 40 lakhs. And there are, typically there are eight cities considered to be metros in India. And these eight are Bombay or Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, eight cities are considered to be metro cities, 40 lakh plus towns. Okay, so far so good, we'll go forward. Next level below the metro is a mini metro. So, Mini Metro is a town with a population between 10 and 40 lakhs. So, if you live in Tamil Nadu, you've heard of Madurai and Coimbatore. If you live in Kerala, you've obviously heard of Kochi. If you live in Karnataka, you've heard of Mysore. If you live in Telangana or Andhra Pradesh, you've heard of Vijayawada and Vizag. If you live in UP, you've heard of Lucknow. If you live in Rajasthan, you've heard of Jaipur. If you live in Gujarat, you've heard of Surat. Right? Maharashtra is Nagpur. Bihar is Patna. These are all mini metros in our country. Okay? 
10 lakh plus population, but less than 40 lakhs. The number of such towns is growing. Because as population of towns in India, the towns which are considered 1, 1 and a half lakhs even 15 years ago, today are 3 or 4 lakhs in population. Okay. Class 1, this is class, not class I, it's class 1. Class 1 town, any town with a population of above 1 lakh is classified as a class 1 town. These are generic terms, these are not market research terms or marketing terms. Remember, everybody knows these terms in the same fashion. Okay. Now, there is something called MRSI and there is something called SMR. But before that, you are clear with metro, mini metro, class 1 towns? Yeah. Fine. So, MRSI is the industry body for market research in India. It's an association. All clients and market research firms voluntarily become members of the association. So, there are fora where you exchange ideas, where you present technical papers, you know, where you can share knowledge with each other, right? There's a code of conduct that governs, if you're, if you're a member, there's a code of conduct that governs our behavior. For example, if you do a survey with somebody, we collect the data from the person, but that person's name cannot be attached to the data and given to the client. Confidentiality is a given, this is assured for the respondent. There is a code of conduct that we all adhere to, voluntarily adhere to in this industry. The research companies and the research buyers and so on and so forth. The MRSI is based on the SOMR. SOMR is the European Society for Opinion and Market Research, industry body. It's the world's best known industry body. So it is, you know, it gives us the guiding principle for many of the, like I said, like I said earlier, code of ethics for governing children. Code of, uh, sorry, for interviewing children, code of ethics for uh, respondent data confidentiality, right? How long should we keep the questionnaires when we do a survey? Can we burn them the next day or should we keep them for some time? We are actually supposed to keep them for six years, six months, and only then we can destroy them. The soft copy of the data from a survey has to be kept for two years, only then we can destroy them. And who owns the data from a survey? Does the research company own the data or does the client own the data? All these are, you know, matters of ethics which are laid out by these governing bodies. Clear so far? Let's go forward. Okay, there are very, very common terms. Um, repeatedly, I have not said this several times without thinking about it. Target group. So, for every market research study, you have to say, what is the target group for the study? Meaning, among whom are we doing that primary research study? So, the TD is the kind of respondents that the study should focus on and should be very definitely and clearly defined in terms of de demographics, definitely in terms of demographics and sometimes in terms of, in terms of psychographics as well. So, what is demographics? We will see that. Now, here is an example of a good definition. My target group for the study is men or women, aged 18 to 30, NCCS A and B, which is for NCCS, New Consumer Classification System, and who are current owners of a two-wheeler, and who live in a metro or a mini-metro. This is an excellent, non-confusing definition of a target group. Correct? Now, in this above example, we have talked about gender, we have talked about age, we have talked about socioeconomic class, we talked about product ownership. We talked about what kind of place to live in. These are called demographic variables. So these are non-debatable, universally understood definitions. It is not vague like rich, for example. It's very specific. Psychographics is you can define the target group in terms of I want introverted people or I want extroverted people. Or I want people with a propensity to spend money. Or I want people with a propensity to save money. I want people who want to be in tune with the latest times. Or I want people who want to be, you know, little old-fashioned in the thought process. Or I want to have, you know, people who are emotionally reacting versus rationally reacting, etc. All that is psychographics. Now, it's also a good way to do research. But that is... Like for socioeconomic class, I said there's a commonly accepted definition all over the country. But for extrovertedness, just for example, there is no such commonly accepted definition. We all know the meaning. An extroverted person is somebody who reaches out to people and talks to people. But how do you define it? 
Do you say, everybody says, oh, if he talks to five people in a party, he's extroverted? There's no such definition. And therefore, psychographics is more difficult to use in a on the ground primary research study. Can we go back to the first slide? Okay, so are you clear about what the household is? Yeah. Chief age owner, housewife or householder, adult, monthly household income, socioeconomic class, and CS, urban and rural definition, metropolitan cities, mini metros, class one towns, market business society of India, SOMA, target group, demographics, psychographics. That brings us to the end of this chapter. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Till we meet again. Bye for now.